Yeah. Uh, Ken Rivet, University of California, Berkeley. Ken. Okay. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about prime numbers. So P is going to be a prime, and it's certainly going to be a prime number bigger than 2. And uh, in, you know, in toy numerical examples, it might be something like 13. But for the interest of this talk, to make the thing really worthwhile, you have to think that P is bigger. So you know, it might be 144, 169, or another good prime is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1. You know, and that's, that's a good number. And you can have much bigger examples. You want to make the prime big enough that the sort of computation that I'm talking about actually represents an improvement over doing things by trial and error, which would be the um, way to do it for, say, P equal 13. <laughs> so um, what are we going to do? We're going to talk pretty much exclusively about numbers mod p. And there are p of them. And as I said last night in my p ball lecture, if you have numbers mod p, it just means any time you have a multiple of p, you kind of ignore it. You throw it, you consider it zero. So for example, the numbers mod p, when p is 13, are just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12, right? There are 13 numbers. Good. Okay. And now um, what happens is you have a number A and you might want to square it. And you might consider the squares of these numbers, modulo P. And if you do that, you're going to use the fact that uh, the square of a negative is the same as the square of its positive. So for example, 12 is the same thing as minus 1, because 12 plus 1 is 13. So when you square 12 and reduce it mod 13, you're just going to get 1. So um, when I do this, of course, if I square 0, I get 0. That's a special case, and it's not really all that interesting. But if I look at the other 12 numbers, then I can make a dividing line here. And when I square the numbers to the right of the dividing line, I just get repeats. So I don't have to worry about them. And if I wanted to compute the squares mod p in this case, I just have to square 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And remember, if I want to, that 0 is always a square. So of course, the square of 1 is 1. The square of 2 is 4. The square of 3 is 9. But I could maybe say that that's minus 4 if I wanted to keep the numbers small and allow minus signs. The square of 4 is uh, 16, which is the same as 3. The, sa the square of 5 is 25, which is the same as 12, but it's also the same as minus 1. And the square of 6, 6 times 6 is 36, but 26 is 0, so that's 10. And I can also think of 10 as minus 3. Um, is that right? Or oh, was well, something wrong? Ah, because here, this is 3. I have to remember. I forgot to kind of look at that as 3. And what you see is there are six numbers here. And because 13 happens to be one more than a multiple of 4, and that's a, kind of a special fact about 13, the six numbers here are actually three numbers and they're negatives. The numbers are 1, 3, and 4 and then minus 1, minus 3, and minus 4. So aside from remembering the minus signs, you can even have um, just three pieces of information to think about the squares mod 13. And so if you want to list the squares mod a number, you can do that by just kind of squaring and keeping track of what you get, and you'll have a list. And the problem of this lecture is somehow um, going the other way, namely, if a number mod p, well, I'll just, uh, let's say, if, um, I don't know, c mod p is a square, what is it the square of? Okay? 
So that's the problem, it's kind of fine square roots. And if you want to think of this as part of the problem of solving quadratic equations, you can do it that way. You can do it because quadratic <coughs> equations can be solved mod p by the usual quadratic formula, provided that you know how to take the square root of the discriminant if you know that it's a square. Now, you can think of this, big prime numbers may suggest to you the world of cryptography, and it might be that the case that you know something is a square because you've been given that information without being given the actual square root. And so you know something is a square, and your task is to find the square root. But in fact, there's another way that you could know that a number is a square without kind of knowing what it had been the square of, and that has to do with a very simple criterion that is based on Fermat's little theorem. So Fermat's little theorem is a statement that uh, everybody learns in elementary number theory courses. It's that if I have a number mod p and I raise it to the pth power, I get the number back. So that's the statement a to the p is equal to a if a is a number mod p. Or you could say equivalently with integers, which we'd also call a. If I take an integer a and I raise it to the pth power, that's congruent to a mod p. And um, in this example, for example, if I took um, 2 to the power 13, I would get 2 mod p. And you might think that's uh, kind of a daunting thing to do. How would I start um, computing 2 to the power 13? Well, one natural way to do it is to think about 13 as a sum of powers of 2. It's 8 plus 4 plus 1. And I can successively compute. I start with 2. Then I compute 2 squared and figure out what it is. Well, it's 4. I can square the result again, and I get 2 to the 4. And I square the result again, and I get 2 to the 8th. That's a relatively small amount of computation, mod 13, because I just, each time that I'm doing the computation, I forget multiples of 13. And then if I multiply 2 to the 1 times 2 to the 4 times 2 to the 8, a very simple thing to do, mod p, I will come up with 2 to the 13, and I will see that this is the same thing as 2 modulo 13. And, um, you know, more generally, if I have a very big prime, I can do exponentiation by the so-called fast exponentiation method, which um, requires basically some logarithmic process in the data. And you can compute powers, and you can verify that this is true. Um, I should say, alternatively, there's a, um, another way that people retain this, you see, a to the p equals a has two pieces of information, if you like. You can say that it's the statement that 2 to the p, uh, rather 0 to the p is 0, um, all the way to the left of this single bar. But of course, 0 to the p is going to be 0, and that's kind of a no-brainer. So the basic thing is to think about what happens if p doesn't divide a. In other words, if a is not a multiple of p, and then, when you say that a to the p is a, you can say, alternatively, that a to the p minus 1 is 1. You can just cancel out this invertible number, mod p, which is a. So these are two different ways of saying Fermat's little theorem. One is to say that a to the p is a for all integers a. And the other is to say that a to the p minus 1 is 1 if a is non-zero, mod p. And the reason that the second one is relevant is that if a is a square, then when I take a and I raise it to the p minus 1 over 2 power, what I'm doing is getting b to the p minus 1, which is 1. All of these are equalities of numbers mod p, or if you like, they're tacit recongruences of numbers mod p. So if a number is a square, its p minus first power is going to be 1. And it's uh, relatively easy to see by um, the right kind of abstract algebra that the converse is true as well. And the reason that the converse is true is that 
by counting numbers in the negatives the way we did here, you will see in general that the number of non-zero squares is p minus 1 over 2. And if you remember that there are um, p minus 1 non-zero numbers, the number of non-squares is also p minus 1 over 2. And the reason that the converse is true is that if you do arithmetic mod p, you are really doing arithmetic over a field. It's completely analogous to the field of rational numbers or complex numbers or real numbers. And the theorem from high school that a polynomial of a given degree can have no more roots than the degree is true in this context as well. And this polynomial x to the p minus 1 over 2 has roots whenever x is equal to a square. And um, that's a lot of roots because there are p minus 1 over 2 squares. So it can't have any roots among the non-squares because that would make too many roots. And in fact, if you have a number a that's not a square, you can reason as follows. You can say that a to the p minus 1 over 2, whatever it is, is a number whose square is equal to 1 by this Fermat little theorem. And since the number a to the p minus 1 over 2 is not 1, these equalities are all congruences, um, the only thing that it could possibly be is minus 1. So you have a very simple criterion, which I think is called Legendre's criterion, that if you have a non-zero number mod p, you can raise it to the p minus 1 over 2 power and see what you get. If you get minus 1, it's not a square. If you get plus 1, it's a square. And that is something you can do in a very um, efficient way by this fast exponentiation. So if somebody gives you a kind of random number, mod even 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, and asks you whether or not it's a square, by doing a quick exponentiation, you can find the answer. If it's a non-square, it's a non-square. Game is over. But suppose it's a square, how do you find the square root? And this is a very common problem in algorithmic number theory. And what I want to explain is how the problem can be solved by a method that's um, easy to retain and easy to explain. And in that respect, it has um, a lot of advantages of a better known algorithm that is due to Dan Shanks, who someone who was around Maryland and uh, that area in the 1960s and 1970s, and it turned out that his algorithm had been found earlier by someone named Tonelli. So if you look for the Shanks-Tonelli algorithm, you will find um, an, exp an explanation of it on Wikipedia or um, the other math sites. But the thing is a little bit mysterious because to explain it properly, you really have to talk about the two silo subgroup and the group of invertible numbers mod p. And uh, the implementation requires a certain amount of uh, juggling. And the algorithm that I want to talk about today is something that apparently has been resurrected only relatively recently. It's due to a mathematician named Michel. Um, Cipolla, who is an Italian mathematician, and the date of this algorithm is roughly 1907. So it's a, it's a good algorithm, and it's probably even earlier than Tonelli. Um, so what does this algorithm involve? Well, basically, if you do the right thing, which I'll tell you how to do, you just write down a formula for the square root. But um, even before telling you about the formula, I have to remind you about something that is um, the basis for one of the two standard proofs of Fermat's little theorem. You can prove Fermat's little theorem, especially in the form a to the p equals a, by a very simple mathematical induction. And this induction depends on the binomial theorem. 
Well, the thing about the binomial theorem is that if I take a prime, say five. So, and, Ken, would you prefer a letter? Oh, yeah, maybe this is kind of petering out. Thanks. Suppose I take um, a prime exponent, you know, and I do the, ex the uh, binomial theorem for x plus y to that power. Well, what will happen? You know, I happen to know these numbers by heart. The coefficients are 1, 5, 10, 10. It's symmetrical, right? Um, 5, 1. And the key point is that the numbers, aside from the ones at the very beginning, the, one, five, the 5, 10, 10, and the 5, are all divisible by p, which in this case is 5. So in general, we would take x plus y to the p, which starts out x to the p plus p times x to the p minus 2, why? And of course, I can't write all of the terms because I don't know how many there are. But the key point is that a typical coefficient is some binomial coefficient p um, choose i, which is an integer. And it's an integer whose numerator is divisible by p, but whose denominator is not divisible by p. And it's an easy lemma using the fact that a prime that divides a product of two integers divides at least one of the factors. It's an easy lemma to prove that these intermediate binomial coefficients, intermediate means everything except the ones in the beginning, are integers that are divisible by p. So in particular, if you work in a world where p has been, you know, gone to zero, like the integers mod p, then the identity is incredibly simple. It's x plus y to the p is x to the p plus y to the p. And the terms in the middle just completely go away. It makes life very simple. You see, and to prove this kind of thing by induction, what you say is, well, you have the base case, um, a equals 0. Um, 0 to the p is 0. And then if you want to go from a to a plus 1, you say, what would a plus 1 to the p be? Well, by the binomial theorem, it's going to be a to the p plus 1 to the p. Now, a to the p, by the inductive hypothesis, has already been known to be a, and 1 to the p is 1. So a plus 1 to the p is um, a, to a plus 1. Okay, so starting with a, you get it for a plus 1. And you don't really have to know it for all integers. You just have to know it for the integers starting at 0 and ending at p minus 1. So you can stop your induction once you get to p minus 1. And uh, you prove the theorem. So that's a very good way to remember a proof of Fermat's theorem. And this same identity is one of the two things that are at the base of Sapola's algorithm. Another thing that's very important is to think about how to make um, bigger fields from smaller fields by adjoining a square root. And the quintessential example of this construction is starting with the real numbers. You might um, want to make the complex numbers. If you describe the field of complex numbers informally to someone, you would say, well, um, maybe I'm using the letter A too much, but uh, I hope it's not a problem. Um, when I talk about complex numbers, I say that they're numbers A plus BI, where A and B are real numbers, but then I have to say how to add them. That's not very problematic. You just add the real and complex parts and, and imaginary parts. But if you think about how to multiply them, when you multiply expressions involving complex numbers, the key thing is that whenever you see I squared, you have to think of it as being the same as minus 1. And 
the question is, um, how could you describe that in some slightly sophisticated terms? And the answer is that what you should do is you can consider polynomials in some variable, which you call x. And in the end, x is going to be deemed to be this i. And what you do is you consider polynomial expressions, you know, a plus bx plus cx squared and so on and so forth. Except any time you see a polynomial that is a multiple of x squared plus 1, you just set it equal to 0. And in particular, if you have an x squared, that's going to be the same thing as minus 1. And if you have, a, if you have some multiple of x squared plus 1, same thing, it's just going to be 0. So you make this construction, you um, call the complex field the ring of polynomials modulo multiples of x squared plus 1. And then when you're all done, you let i be the image of x in this um, quotient ring is really what it is. And, you know, people kind of understand, um, I think, pretty easily quotient rings. In fact, if you look at the integers modulo m, that is the same kind of quotient. You take all of the integers and then you just throw away all the things that are multiples of m. So it's really the same kind of construction. And uh, what I hope to do in uh, kind of the last part of this talk is show you how this construction can be implemented in freely available open source mathematical software. It's not just pie in the sky. You can really do this. And um, so here we are um, making this uh, construction. And the thing that you have to remember is that when you do this, there's really not very much that's special about the field of real numbers. So as an analog, what you could do is instead of R, you could just have um, what I would call F sub P, which is just um, the set or ring or whatever you want to call it of integers mod P. Um, so this is a, um, finite field, as people like to call it. And what makes it a field, you can add and subtract and multiply and divide. And divide, that's the key thing, by the Euclidean algorithm, if you have a non-zero number mod p, you can find an inverse for it. You can find another number, if a is not divisible by p, you can find an a prime, such that a a prime is congruent to one mod p. So this is really um, the good stuff. And what's going to be the analog of minus <laughs> one? Well, minus 1 might be a square. For example, I think we saw that when uh, p was 13, 12 was a square. Um, it's a square of 5, in fact. So we don't want to just say minus 1, but um, we'll use this letter b again for some reason. Let's say b is equal to some non-square. And then we can really form the field fp of x modulo x squared um, minus b, right, x squared plus 1 is x squared minus minus 1. So in other words, what we're doing is we are formally adjoining a square root of b. If I let, uh, I shouldn't call it i, let's call it omega, be the image of x in um, this field, then omega is an imaginary element that we have created in the same way that i is an imaginary number whose square is equal to b. So we can endow the field with p elements with a square root of b. Of course, we get something very bigger, uh, much bigger, because a typical element of this uh, field will be, say, alpha plus beta times omega. Probably should have used alpha and beta on the left, where alpha and beta are in the field that's analogous to the field of real numbers. So there are um, p squared elements in this field. Um, this field is kind of twice as big as fp in the same way that the complex field is twice as big as the field of real numbers. OK, so now we're in good shape. And now I can describe for you 
Suppose algorithm. So remember, the problem is the following. We are given A to be a square, and let's assume that it's non-zero mod P, just to fix ideas, because if we're looking for a square root of zero, we can find one pretty easily. It's just going to be zero. And then um, one thing that's uh, not so obvious is what the B is going to be. How are you going to use this construction, which involves a non-square? And the problem, it's not a real problem in practice, but theoretically the problem is that this algorithm is probabilistic. Which is to say that you make random choices until you find an element that you need. Okay, so what you do is you consider numbers t mod p, and for every t, you look and see what t squared minus a is. And you ask yourself, is it a non-square? Okay, well, there's no reason why it's going to be a square if you choose t randomly. And in fact, the probability that this is true is roughly one half. And more precisely, you can count the number of t mod p such that t squared minus a is uh, not a square, mod p. And the number, it's an integer, so it can't be p over 2, which is half the possible number of t. But it's, I think, p plus 1 over 2, or maybe even p plus 3 over 2. There's a slight bias toward getting a square. But roughly speaking, you know, it's a half. So you take a number at random, and you see whether the thing is uh, a square. And if it is, you say, yep, too bad. And then you flip the coin again. Choose another random value of t. Of course, you have to use a pseudo-random generator to get random numbers. You do it again. And if five times in a row um, you've gotten squares, um, you've done something that kind of after you already had probability 1 over 32. So it's really not your lucky day. But odds are, very quickly, that you will get um, a non-square. And when you get a non-square, this is the thing that we'll call b. And then we do exactly this construction. We let omega be um, the number in fp of x modulo x squared minus b with the property that omega to uh, omega squared is equal to b. Okay, so we do this, we create this mathematical system. And then the claim is that if I take t plus omega, so t is an ordinary number mod p, I can take t plus omega, and if I raise that to the p plus 1 power, this is going to be um, a square root of a. Okay? And this is going to be a square root of a in this bigger field. x squared minus b. Okay? So you might say that's a problem because we wanted to get a square root of a in the smaller field. We wanted to get a square root of a in fp. But the point is that uh, for the same reason that a polynomial of degree, you know, p minus 1 over 2 can't have um, more than two roots, in a field, a number cannot have more than two square roots. And we know by hypothesis that the square roots of A, whatever they are, are in the initial field FP. So if we find two square roots of A that are in the bigger field, well, in fact, they have to be the square roots in the smaller field. Okay, and in fact, what's really bizarre is that in proving this claim, we never use a hypothesis that A is a square. And what happens is that if A is not a square, you will produce a square root of A in this bigger field, which is perfectly fine, okay? And in fact, what you're showing is a well-known fact about finite fields, which is that once you um, adjoin a single square root to the prime field, Fp, in that bigger thing, you will have the square roots of all the numbers in Fp. Um, you don't have to go any further. That's kind of different from what happens in abstract algebra courses. If you take the field of rational numbers and you join the square root of 2, 
in that bigger field, you don't have a square root of three. And you don't have a square root of five. The more square roots you make, the more um, you, um, the bigger the field you get. But in, in the world of finite fields, things are much simpler. In a huge field, as big as you like, FP has only a single quadratic extension. And this is it. So if you work in there, you're going to find square roots of everything. Okay. So now how do I prove this claim? Well, I do some calculation. So the first thing is that I take t plus omega to the p plus 1, and I write it as t plus omega to the first power times t plus omega to the p. And then I use this identity that's over on the left. In a world where p is equal to 0, the p power of the sum is the sum of the p power. So here's t plus omega, and here's t to the p plus omega to the p. Okay. And t to the p, by Fermat's little theorem, is t. And it will turn out, we have to verify this, that omega to the p is minus omega. And when you um, see that, then you have you know, x plus y times x minus y. You get t squared minus omega squared, which is t squared minus b. And t squared minus b is equal to a by the initial construction. So the only thing that's missing from the proof of this claim is why omega to the p is minus omega. And um, to prove that, we just have to prove that omega to the p minus 1 is minus 1. And that's not going to be hard, because omega to the p minus 1 is omega squared to the p minus 1 over 2. Omega squared is b. So we have b to the p minus 1 over 2. And we are now raising a non-square to the p minus 1 over 2. And I explained that when you do that, you get minus 1. Okay, By the principle that a polynomial of a given degree cannot have more roots than you think. So omega um, to the p is really minus p. And the proof is complete. Okay. So that's all there is to the algorithm. And now what I want to do is a practical demonstration. So first of all, I have to um, unmute um, the AV. So something is going to come up. Yeah, and the mouse. Hmm? Move out the mouse. Uh, yeah, OK. So. OK, so I'm now going to repeat some of the things I said. I taught uh, number theory class this morning at 8 AM as a guest lecturer. What I'm running here is a software package called SAGE that stands for Software for Arithmetic Geometry Experimentation. And SAGE is uh, a free software package that you can get. Let me see if I can bring this up here. Go to sagemath.org and see if it comes. This is the home page for SAGE where you can download binaries for the um, operating system of your choice. And you can also, if you don't want to download the program to your personal computer, you can work online. There is uh, a server in Seattle. Um, this software was designed by William Stein, who's a professor of math at the University of Washington. And you can sign into their online server and get a notebook that looks like the notebook um, that I have in the other tab. So this notebook that I'm showing you right now has to do with some calculations of the, you know, the RSA crypto system I was doing one day for a photography class. And now if I go one tab over, I'm no longer in Washington. I'm right here in Arcata. And this laptop is running um, the software. So what I've done is I've added some uh, bit of explanation. It's uh, typeset in some fairly decent way. Can you make that bigger? Can I make it bigger? I don't think so. Control plus. Command, command, command. 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 All right, okay. Let's see if it works. Okay. So what we've done, what we're doing is uh, we're going to do some calculations with Sage. Um, one thing that people do when they start up Sage is they type one plus one to see how fast they get two, because you know the operating system has been busy doing other things like email and has to get um, all of the binaries uh, out of its swap place and you know, into active memory. 
So it can take a, a moment or two to. So it doesn't get, inspire. I can do that. <laughs> well, you could probably wow. say. Yeah. Ah, okay. You could probably so say that the problem know. was that uh, I don't have enough memory in my laptop. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1. And you see that it's, uh, it, you just echo back the number, which uh, proves the statement, well, proves, but um, <laughs> justifies the statement that I made before, which is that this number is actually a prime number. Now, what I want to do is I want to find the square root of something. So why don't I take a number and square it, and then take that number mod p, and then use Chipola's algorithm to try to find the square root. So my number is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and, uh, you know, I could even change that. I could change the, well, we'll, we'll do another example in a while. Um, so if I square 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and reduce the result mod p and echo back the result, it's this number 1, 5, 2, 3, whatever. <coughs> and in the next line, um, the Kronecker symbol, also called the Legendre symbol, is just a way of computing a to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p very rapidly. And if you compute it, you see that you get 1, which is the expected answer, because this is actually a square. So the question is, um, how do you um, find the t, such that t squared minus a is uh, a non-square? Well, you just take some values. Instead of taking random values of t, I took t equal 1, 2, and 3, just to see what would happen. Um, those might be a little special, so I, I don't know, but you could take other values. And you see what happens is that uh, you get a non-square when t is 2. You get a non-square when t is 3. Those are those minus 1s. When t is 1, the thing happens to be a square. So let's take t equal 2. So now the next line is the um, more serious one. I'm actually wanting, I want to do computations with polynomial rings. So GF of P, GF stands for either Gauss field or Galois field, no one ever knows. Um, that's just the field with P elements, it's the integers mod P. And I take the polynomial ring over that field and say that the variable of the ring will be X. So that's my R of X, and there it is. And the thing is being typeset in a pretty way, so you see that it's f sub p of x, where p is this large number. And then I just read into um, memory um, t equal 2, where b is t squared minus a, always taken mod p, echo back the b, and um, type the Kronecker symbol. So I do all that. Um, the b, which is you know, of no great shakes to us, is uh, 108216-8870, and the Kronecker symbol is minus one, which is a, um, just reminding us, it's the same minus one that's in the middle of one minus one and minus one. It's just reminding us that this number is a non-square. Now, what I have to do is I have to take the polynomial ring and mod out by x squared minus b. So that's really just what I do. I take QUO, it's quotient ring, mod out by the ideal generated by x squared minus b. And I'll get a ring, which is called S. This ring um, turns out, of course, to be the field with uh, p squared element. So it says that it's a univariant quotient polynomial ring in omega over the finite field of the size and the modulus, meaning the thing we divided by was this um, x squared minus b. Whoa. Okay, let's get that back. Okay. Okay, now, um, if I square omega, I should get b. And I do. b is this 108 number. And now, the thing that I call root is the t plus omega to the p plus 1. <gasps> oh, I did something wrong. <laughs> okay. What I did wrong, see, is I computed um, t plus omega to the p plus 1, and I got a. But that's not a square root of a. See, I don't want to get a. I want to get a only when I square something. So the thing I have to square is t plus omega to the p plus 1 over 2. If I square that, um, I will get a. So the number um, without the brackets, without the square, is the square root.
Okay, so let's go back to the software. My root is t plus omega to the p plus 1 over 2. I ask myself, what is this root? You could uh, expect to get an element in the quotient ring. You should expect, you know, if you do this to a random thing, you're going to get an expression involving omega. But um, instead, what you get is something that's an ordinary integer. And what ordinary integer is it? It's the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that you started with. Um, if instead, you know, just to fool around, instead of t, I took 2 times t, and I asked um, what would happen. Well, here I seem to get a number um, times omega. Um, if I add, um, you know, 1 to it, I just, well, it's pretty interesting. You tend to get a lot of ordinary integers. Um, yeah, or something times omega. I guess you can prove by a very simple argument that when you square the thing, you're either going to get an integer or an integer times omega. Um, maybe that's the point. Um, because Okay, well, let's, let, let's do another example and not try to speculate in real time. I'll go back and erase the stuff that I put in. And you get the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I tried to do an, an example with a larger prime. So I took 10 to the 12th, which is a pretty big number. And I asked Sage for the next prime number after that. And it's um, 1 with a lot of zeros followed by 3, 9. And now the number that I'm going to square is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And I get some number. And I look for some Kronecker symbols to find a non-square, just taking t equal 1, 2, and 3. And this time, I get a non-square when t is 3. So I do the same thing I did again. I'm just doing this, you know, kind of interactively instead of trying to write some loops. Um, I take uh, my b, which is going to be my non-square. I introduce the polynomial ring which I have to do again because uh, p is a different prime. It's this 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 9. And I make the quotient ring, and um, I square um, omega, which shows that its square is really the b. That's uh, the non-square um, in the prime field. And when I take the root, what I get is a number that doesn't at all look like um, the number that I squared which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And of course, the solution to this apparent conundrum is that when you square a number and get its square root, you might be getting the negative of what you started with. And having all these nines at the beginning is the clue that you have a negative mod p of some relatively small number. And in fact, um, if you um, negate it, you get the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So um, basically, that's the story. It's a very simple algorithm. It's easy to implement in software. And it's easy to remember and can be explained without talking a lot about the group theory of a multiplicative group of numbers, mod p. I'll stop there. Okay, so I think I've done something relatively simple, but if you go to um, if you go to Wikipedia and look up Chipola's algorithm, I think you'll find that it does nth roots just as well. It's going to help me hack in and break very secure stuff. Well, it's it's kind of like investing in the stock market. You know, like if you find some information and you want to use it to pick a stock. Odds are that the market has already factored in what you've learned. And unless you're really kind of surfing the wave, anything that you learn in this way has already been figured out by the people who don't want you to hack in. And basically what cryptographers do when they work for banks, let's say, is they try to um, hack into the bank's um, crypto systems, um, pretending to be people from the outside to see whether the thing is really secure against um, known attacks. Okay, so this historically has been around since the turn of the century. Yeah, this is century, really so. over 100 years old. Right, but a guy like you or a guy on the surf and the wave in yeah. number theory, cryptography, 
uh, found some new, quicker way to take. Well, I guess you're not going to make something uh, secure. Something secure, you depend on squaring and square rooting. But yeah. aren't hackers uh, number theoretically trying to break time factorization? Or? Absolutely. So the, the key um, barrier is, um, first of all, the, the naive factorization of a, of a number is just trial division, which has, you know, takes kind of the square root of the number many steps. So that's exponential. And you can make um, very, um, very sophisticated attacks that are um, exponential with a lower exponent. So there are all these, you know, number field sieve and so on that are around with these factoring tools. And of course, factoring can be done very quickly if the prime factors of your secret number happen to have certain properties. And that's kind of what's behind my answer to you. Namely, all those properties are known by people working for the banks and so on. And they kind of studiously avoid those things that make the thing very easy. Um, if you have an algorithm that's at all sub-exponential, which means that it's between polynomial and exponential, people get very nervous and they try to um, create other crypto systems that avoid this apparent weakness. Um, so for example, in, in, in a cryptography course like the one I teach, the two kind of defining problems are factorization and discrete logarithms. So discrete logarithms involves having a number mod p, <coughs> Say this number is g, and somehow g is known, and its nth power a is known, and the question is to find n. So roughly speaking, this is a problem whose difficulty seems to be similar to the difficulty of factoring. And there is a method called index calculus that does discrete logarithms in time that's a little bit faster than um, exponential. It's kind of sub-exponential. And this made people very, very insecure, in, in the sense that they're insecure. They were the crypto systems were insecure. And what happened is that there was a move to elliptic curves as opposed to just numbers mod p, where the discrete logarithm problem appeared to be resistant to the kind of attacks that work for numbers mod p. Um, so there are kind of a lot of people thinking about these problems. And you know the kind of holy grail would be to have an idea that you know, that nobody else oh, yeah. knows, and you keep it secret, and you exploit it, it's um, seeming increasingly difficult. And, and don't sell it to Kaizen. Right. right. <laughs> secret, secret. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is Sapolo's algorithm faster than the shanks Canelli algorithm? <sighs> you know, I, I think not in any significant way. I think if you know what you're doing, you can use either algorithm, um, and it takes roughly the same amount of time. Both are probabilistic, mm -hmm. and once you get the parameters, um, Shanks' algorithm is not very slow. Um, and, and this requires, you know, you do some calculation in the field with p squared elements. So I'd say it's kind of a wash, but the advantage of this method is it's, it's elegant somehow. Um, it's a lot easier to explain than, than the other. Well, I'll spend time to spend more time. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get a quick question, you can on the way out. Okay, well, thank you all for your hospitality. Yeah.